Yo, what is up guys? It is your boy Speed here, and today I'm going to show you like a rank 600 average game that I played. Absolutely hilarious, a great game, and I want to teach you guys uh, kind of how you can change your item builds and, and, and make decisions based on the game state. You know, how do you adapt to what's going on? And just kind of adapt to the draft in general. What's really funny about this game in particular is that uh, what ended up happening was I thought I was position three. They were like, hey, anyone's a position three player? I'm like, yeah, I'll just play my profit, you know, it is what it is. And they're like, no, nah, I got it. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I'm a five. And so I transitioned to five. That's why you got to know how to play different roles. You got to know what's going on in order to gain MMR and solo queue. In fact, I've been talking to, to uh, you know, some of my students are like, Speed, I can't win my support games, right? They're, they're core players. They've run out of those role queue games. All of a sudden, what's going on? They're stuck. They can't win. And I'm like, you got to be able to do, you know, you got to be able to do both. And typically, we'll cover a little bit of the other role just to make sure they got a, a little bit of a balance. So make sure you do that in your games as well. Balance. Don't be afraid of the other roles. Don't convince yourself that, oh, if I play some support for a week or a month, I'm going to be a worse carry because I haven't practiced for that month. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Trust me, if you're playing Dota for the next year, two, three years, like uh, most of us probably are going to be, then uh, you'll be all right. If you haven't already, go check out the Game Leap website as I'll be making videos like this over there. I make one a day videos like the YouTube videos, if not better. And so, yeah, click the link down below. Go sign up now and I will help you to get to the MMR that you want. All right, let's hop into it. All right, and personally, this is also one of the best games I had. If I show you guys the net worth, oh my god. I ended this game 11-3, and, and like, if you look at the net worth, you can barely tell who is who. Like, keep in mind, I'm the 5. Who is no... I think he's the offlaner. Yeah, I was more farm than the offlaner. <laughs> and this is our mid laner. <laughs> I was at the same net worth as them. It was a crazy game. It was really... Like, literally, I'm position 5, but I'll kind of show you why this happens, and... Do keep in mind, this is a bit of an outlier game in terms of gold, but I'll still obviously go over everything that makes me a, a good support player and why it's important to be able to transition and be greedy when you can be greedy. You know, I think a lot of players think that, especially five players, they think that, okay, I'm supposed to be the sacrificial role. There's no rule book. Now, there's things that, you know, make things better on average. And yeah, I would say being somewhat sacrificial on five on average is okay. Doesn't mean you can't push waves, doesn't mean you can't take the hard farm if you're the hero that does that. And uh, so yeah, let's cover that. Okay, so in the laning stage, pretty simple. I'm against two ranged heroes, Prophet in general, pretty good against ranged heroes. Why? Because they tend to have like met armor. Um, you know, DP's got three, it's okay. Lion's got what, like zero or something like that? I think he's, oh no, Lion has three armor? What was this? I swear the hero had much less. Nonetheless, yeah, so Treants, because they can't get Stout Shield blocked, you might be thinking, Speed, what are you talking about? It's like the built-in passive. You know how most melee heroes have this built-in passive? Well, they do. And so Treants don't get blocked by that. And so it's really nice to play against these ranged heroes because Treants, they actually do a lot to them. Where against melee heroes, it's pretty underwhelming how much damage Treants actually do. And then this Lion went for the pole. I obviously knew he was going to try to block the, uh, the creep camp. He really committed for that, which in my opinion, I'm not going to lie. I feel like, I feel like that was just bad because... In my opinion, he can play the lane fine early on. If he stands behind or next to the DP, he can just hit the treants inside the creep wave and be fine. But he did that, which I thought was a big grief to his lane. And then, because he was so low, I was able to zone both of them almost entirely out of the lane. I also got some big denies here. You know, a little profit gameplay coming in. No CS for the DP. And I make this heads up play here. So, guys, let me ask you a quick question, okay? So I can engage you a little bit. What am I supposed to do here? Give me, I'm going to give you a couple context points. First off, the lion is dragging the wave, right? So lion pulled our creep away from in between our tier one and tier two. He's going all the way around. He's going to bring it in front of his tier one tower. And uh, what should I do, right, in this position? What's my play? Do I go chase him? I'm the five. Usually I'm supposed to chase that stuff, right? Yeah, but the situation was a bit weird and I hadn't read it originally. And so what do I do now? All right, final answer. Yeah, final answer. Well, what you're supposed to do is you want to bring the wave around. You want to bring it all the way around in between the tower and connect it here. Why? Because then the lane equilibrium essentially statics overall. It resets. And now my PA can farm here. We're going to deny up an entire wave because on Dire, right? Just keep in mind, Lion's on Dire. He can't actually drag the wave in between. So I knew he couldn't complete the pull. He even got messed up a little bit by this pull camp, so he only got two of the creeps. And uh, what ends up happening is a great situation where now we're going to get, like, basically an extra wave 
or an extra half wave from them. They end up side pulling to try to combat it a little bit, but but at the end of the day, we're still going to get the XP, right? That's not going to completely cancel out, and we get a lot of denies, so that was a huge play as well for us, and then DP just gets beat up by me. <laughs> Classic profit. You just auto-attack people to death. Next up, I'd like to talk about when to know how to rotate out of lane. Very often, people leave too early. I would say the main thing that happens is people leave too early, not too late. Right here, there's a situation where I could consider TPing top. You'll see I shift my camera over, you know, nothing really was happening bottom, so I can obviously shift my attention otherwhere, and I, I go top here. Now, how do I determine whether or not I'm going to TP, right? Because my mid is TPing in, I can maybe clean up, right? Help, uh, help block with treants, but I don't do that. Why don't I do that? Well, let's take a look at what I check here. You're going to see I click on the, the Earth Spirit. That's the first thing I do. And this is very important because when I TP in, you can see even on the marker here, I had already queued up the TP. I was considering it. But because this guy has no roll and Tusk has no mana, I quickly decide that this isn't worth it, right? Tusk cannot chase. And so I just don't go for it. Instead, I have this great option of just pulling. And I think a lot of people would be like, oh, speed, really? But all you're getting out of it is a, is a pull, right? That's so valuable here. It's actually insanely valuable here. My PA was having a good lane. And therefore, if I can drag the wave back when the enemy is already losing the lane and we even threaten kills on them, they're going to be put in a really awkward position. It's also going to give me a little bit of experience in gold as well, which is great. And uh, yeah, that's just something to think about for your games. Don't feel like you have to leave the lane if you won your lane. When you win your lane, you can make the lane completely impossible to play. Like for now, DP's doing okay. You can see she's pretty low, right? But she's doing all right. I mean, in terms of levels. And so I can continue to try to shut her down just by getting off poles. And it really is very valuable when you have kill threat. Now, I talked about knowing when to transition, right? I said that that was going to be one of the major themes of this video. And so let's get into it. Right here, I'm level 6, minute 10. Things are going pretty well, you know, I'm a high level. I, this is also before Tome, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I hadn't even purchased a Tome. Me and my uh, Earth Spirit just happen to be very high levels this game. And so right here, should I go core? Should I buy an Orchid? What do you guys think? Should I buy Orchid? Honestly, like, I think this is a really important question because it's one of those things that I guess is not discussed a lot, which is like, when do you know to go greedy? Because it's a good Orchid game, I would argue, you know. Jug, Storm, I can force out Mantas, force out Yules, or just kill them, right? Why should I not go for that here? Because I'm not going to get to it in time. By the time I get to the Yules, they're going to have BKBs, Mantas, Yules on Death Prophet, you know? They're going to have all these items, and so it's not really going to do anything. By the time I get the item, it's going to be practically worthless. However, things change. This is why Dota is such a hard game. I end up going mid here, just auto-attacking the Storm. I, I saw that he had low mana. And so obviously I'm like, uh oh, I, okay, I can uh, help out with a kill. Unfortunately, <laughs> my Phantom Assassin ended up getting fingered and died. Well, you know what that means for Von Jillian? <laughs> Two levels. <laughs> Two levels and uh, yeah, like 600 gold or something. I think it says 500 here, but I always feel like it's a bit more. So uh, yeah, I get this crazy influx of gold and XP and all of a sudden my game plan kind of changes. I'm like, okay, I just got like some insane amount of gold. I almost have a full Oblivion staff and I'm level 8, which means I can get really active. I'm going to be much tankier. I'm going to hit harder and I have max treants as well as a tome flying out soon, which honestly, I probably should have gave to someone else. Oh, by the way, that was freaking sick. I'm going to show you guys that. But you see what I'm saying? Like I make the quick call here to say, okay, you know, it still really is greedy. I, you know, could say that buying a Ghost Scepter and a Glimmer Cape is also crazy valuable, which it would be. Being able to save myself and teammates from Storm Zips, which is the major threat of the early game, is very valuable. But all right, take a look at this. Like, come on, this is nasty, guys. You gotta, you know, look at this. This is this is what you call prime profit gameplay. Ooh, we get the surround. Brian start <laughs> he starts panicking. He's like, ah, oh, help. And then he gets assassinated. Obviously, we hit him with the good game well played as well. You know, you gotta taunt people. When you, when you outplay him that hard, you gotta hit him with a good game well played. And on top of that, the game started to go our way. You know, funny enough, we were 2k behind, even though the bottom lane was very good. We uh, were a little bit behind, but the enemy team started overextending. We get some treant blocks onto the ogre, and I continued to be in range for these kills over and over again. I just happened to not be the one frontlining, not being the one getting gun on. It was my teammates. And so I really put a priority on this game on hitting my orca timing. And you'll notice my gameplay shifts from a support to a core very quickly. What I mean by this is I literally soak space. And you might be saying, Speed, you're a five. Aren't you just griefing your team? Well, let's look at the map. Because actually, I asked myself that question in the middle of the game. I didn't, you know, I didn't pause the game and say, uh, Paul, do you think you should, uh, go core or support this game? <laughs> I didn't do that. But what I did do is I said, okay, 
is me farming bottom going to ruin someone's game? Specifically, I looked at PA because PA is our win condition. And even though she wasn't really, you know, like the win condition in this game, she did well, but she didn't really like solo carry, but usually she would be, right? So I'm keeping that in mind. I look at the map, she TP top. I'm like, okay, she TP top. I knew that as well, right? I'm like, okay, she literally TP top, which means there's no chance she's coming up here. And therefore, I hard committed to, to bottom, right? Usually I wouldn't, but I see a lot of heroes mid. I see them pushing mid. I feel like, okay, I can't defend this. And so I shift my way back to bottom with Treants. I go for some deep words and I want to, you know, continue to play the bottom side of the map. Obviously, I'm still going to spend a little bit of time TPing into their jungle and putting down wards. I've maxed out teleport at this point. So, you know, I just want to put down some deep vision, scout things out for later on. Just so we can have a general sense of where the storm is. You know, I think what these two wards do here might be saying speed. If, if storm is hunting your team, why would you want deep wards? Why would that be useful? Well, it actually is much better against storm because if you think about it, where's storm going to zip from to kill you? He's going to zip from like here, right? This part of the map and this part of the map. And well, and then I guess the next thing you would ask is, well, but that's not where the wards are. Yeah, but these wards will see him if he walks in the direction. To be fair, he can also TP to the tier ones, in which case they're not too useful. I guess just from a learning point for myself, I could argue that I could put down a ward at a tier one tower, either one, just to scout out storm TP rotations with his orchid, which I think is a very legit point as well. But yeah, I decided from the deep jungle here, my team was getting ganked and whatever. I decided to TP back only because I didn't want to be in the jungle at that point. I literally just wanted to leave, so I'm like, all right, whatever, I'll TP in and steal this ogre kill. Uh, but yeah, now I can just push out bottom. I deny up the DP's wave to tilt the heck out of her. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm just going to wait to form my market. All right, and this is why early timing is coming to play, you know. A little 17, no, 18 minute work it. I hit the storm with my ulti. He panics. He's like, oh, oh, this guy's an orchid. <laughs> hey, yes, sir. I also told my team, hey, guys, I have orchid. I'm TPing in. Very important to communicate. Can't just expect people to know what you have. But when you have orchid as profit, doesn't mean you solo kill people, right? As strong as you are, you know, pretty strong. I'm still probably not going to solo kill the storm there. It would be very close at the least. And so I don't try. I tell him to TP in and then this guy, uh, yeah, he died pretty quickly. And they just kept feeding too. This team, that's the thing about solo queue. You get one pick off and it turns into like four because people have no discipline. Guys, if your teammates die, just... Chill, you know, like go do something else. Now at this point in the game, I could tell the enemy team was tilting and we have crazy good pick off. We have PA blur with my TP orchid. We have hoodwink. I mean, we have so much pick off. Look at all of our heroes. It's literally just pick off galore. And so this is where the deep wards really come into play. I even put one between uh, their tier two and tier three here. You can see it right here. It somehow got deworded. I don't know how. I don't know how that got deworded, but it is what it is. But I was telling my Tusk, hey, we can look for a storm pick off here. I literally said this. And how do I know this is going to happen? Well, Let's take a look at the game state. How do I know that Storm might go onto that ward? Well, if we go back a little bit, I end up picking up the Storm. We see the DP. Okay, we'll zoom ahead. Right, skip, 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 skip. Storm's respawning in, in one. And he pushes in this top wave, right? So just based off that point of information, I assume he's going to make the natural rotation back through his jungle to here. He doesn't want to push up, right? You know, now that he knows that I have this orchid, until he has BKB, uh, which he even bought Kaya. This guy was having a god game, but he got shut down a little bit. But now, you know, until he's BKB, he can't really be safe anywhere, you know, because I can be there with Orchid. And so, you know, I knew he was going to take the natural rotation back, fearing a gang, right? He can't just keep going. And so I told my Tusk, hey, read this, right? Go here, look here. You can see, oh, there's the ping. Yes! I'm so glad in-game speed did that so I could show it in the video. Great job! <laughs> but look, right, I, I read this and I'm like, okay, the natural rotation is back. I tell Tusk to start running up there. We see him. I TP in, obviously, behind the trees. You don't want to see him. Uh, have him see the animation, and we easily destroy him. All right, and that's going to be about the end of the video. Don't click off yet because I do have one more clip to show you. Uh, it's about 24 minutes into the game. Very natural progression of a game here. Get a lead, snowball your net worth. Don't go high ground like your typical pub. <laughs> Take Roche, maybe smoke it up, or the enemy team runs into you. You know, they were trying to contest our Roche, but they were pretty late. So, uh, yeah, they started to feed and, you know, typical Dota. They feed, they feed, they feed. I look for the live pickoff. Couldn't get him because I'm slow. Sorry, I'm, I'm almost 20, 22. You know, I'm getting pretty old at this point. I barely can react to anything. But I just want to say, you know, this is why for all you support players, I'm not saying you have to learn how to play profit and get 124 CS in 25 minutes and be 11 and, and 15. That's not the purpose of this video. But I, what I wanted to really show you guys is that you can dominate your lanes, right? Like, 
I really dominated that, that DP pretty hard. She was like 800 net worth behind my PA at that point of the game, right? On top of that, when you get ahead, it's not necessarily about making crazy plays. It's about knowing your win condition. Even if I, for instance, didn't get that storm kill to put me two levels ahead, I still would have hit a lot of creeps. Why? Because I was maxing treants. And that's what Nature's Prophet does. If you go watch Puppy, that's what he does most of the time. Sometimes you can just run around TPing, putting down deep wards, pushing in waves of treants, and like basically being the vision guy the entire game. That works as well. It's totally an option for, for Prophet support. But at the end of the day, Prophet support can go super greedy. And as a position 5 player and 4 player, you want to have the ability to carry games in your arsenal. I'm not saying you got to be the guy with all the net worth, but you got to be able to, you do have to have that option when the time comes upon you. But I hope this gives you some perspective. I'll see you in the next one. And I'm out. Peace. And that's all. But remember, before you leave, come on, before you tune out, subscribe to the Game Leap website where we are going to help you get to the next rank. If you're stuck, click the link down below. And I'm out. Peace.